Hi everyone, my name is Avery Wyman. I'm a PhD student in the UCLA Department of History, um, and I've been an affiliate of the Nazarian Center for several years now, uh, first as a graduate fellow, um, but my involvement with the center actually extends back to my time as an undergrad when I participated in this very conference in for the third annual, I think maybe second or third annual conference, so it's good to be back um, in one of the many capacities that I've played in this conference. Um, I'm being asked if we could all turn on our cameras to smile for a nice photograph. So if you're off camera and you could turn yourself on for a second, just so we can see your beautiful smiling faces, that would be much appreciated. Okay, um, and then today we're going to start with our first panel, which is called Zionism and Other Nationalisms. So we'll hear presentations on original work by four students. So first, Laura Lee will present her project From Nation State to Diaspora, The Rise of Transnationalism in Contemporary Israeli Culture. Then Sanaya Joshi, who's a beautiful student of mine, a great student from this quarter, uh, will present her project Zionism and Indian Nationalism, Israel, Palestine, and Kashmir. Then Samantha Brody will present her project Nationalist Narratives of the Six-Day War. And lastly, Noah Kipnis will present her project To Exist is to Resist, Tracking Solidarity Between Ireland and Israel-Palestine during the 20th century. Each presentation will be right around eight minutes long. Um, and the panel will conclude around 10.15 a.m. Pacific Standard Time uh, with some closing remarks by me and hopefully some time for some questions as well. Um, and then there'll be a short break before our next panel as well. So with that, I wanna turn the floor over to our first presenter, uh, Laura Lee. Okay, awesome, great, thank you so much. So I'm Laura Lee and I will be presenting on uh, From Nation State to Diaspora, The Rise of Transnationalism in Contemporary Israeli Cinema. And so just to sort of um, begin, this project will explore the growing representation of transnational identities in uh, modern Israeli cinema. And my research is sort of going to be a critical analysis on Israeli director Iran Reikles and his motivations through two of his films, The Syrian Bride, as well as The Lemon Tree. And these are sort of older contemporary films now, considering it's 2023. Um, but I think that they're really critical moments in Israeli cinema where we begin to see a shift in sort of transnational themes. And so through this presentation, I will be posing the questions, how have Israeli directors' transnational experiences galvanized their unique and global film approaches? And also what impact does this growing transnationalism have in historically traditionalist industry? So just to sort of offer some context on the Israeli film industry, it's relatively new when you compare it in the context of the Hollywood industry, which is probably the most well-known and robust industry um, in the world. But the Israeli industry did emerge in the 1950s, shortly after the state's establishment. Um, and Zionist values were sort of the foundation for this cinema. It was really a way for populations to create a collectivist national identity. And in the early years, many of these films centered around war and religion. Um, they were really focused on this sentimental ethos and they wanted to sort of create something for um, Israeli uh, citizens to sort of unionize behind. Um, and this was encouraged by the Israeli government. And in fact, in 1954, the Knesset passed the law for encouragement of Israeli films, and this established um, Israeli cinema as a cinematic artifact reflecting public life that occurs within Israel's geopolitical borders. So they definitely emphasized that nationality aspect of um, the industry. And by 2000, um, the government later updated this law and they passed the new cinema law. And this came into effect by allocating a yearly allowance, certain funds that would create um, domestic productions. And this really incentivized more Israeli directors to come out. In fact, right now, Israel is very popular among the international film industry. It has many film schools. And um, it has, I think, 10 film festivals that it hosts a year, which is quite a lot considering how small the state is. And so moving on into what is the transnationalist aspect of this research project, 
Um, transnationalism refers to the phenomenon in which individuals, ideas, goods, societies stretch beyond national borders. Um, in film, this can be sort of characterized by a diverse method of production. Um, one way transnationalism in cinema can occur can be when um, certain countries will collaborate in their productions. So that could mean something from sharing production between Israel and the United States or Israel and other uh, European countries. Or in the context of my uh, presentation, I'm going to be focusing on the representation of multicultural identities in Israeli cinema. And so um, that brings me to how contemporary Israeli cinema is experiencing the shift in global perception as more filmmakers are becoming contenders for international film festivals and awards and how um, the industry is sort of shifting away from what sort of constitutes as nationhood and nationality. And so there's trying to incorporate more multicultural and transnational themes. All right, so my case study is going to focus primarily on the Israeli director, Iran Reikles, and he has a transnational background himself. He was born in Jerusalem, but he did spend much of his upbringing out of, um, out of Israel. He grew up in Canada, and he also attended um, high school in New York, the United States, and he even received his professional training from Britain's National Film and Television School, and he was the first Israeli to do so. Um, and common themes throughout his films uh, revolve around the, you know, discussion of national borders and how how citizens within Israel are related to those outside. And he taught he covers topics ranging from migration and diaspora, as well as the different cross cultural relationships um, that emerge. And I will be covering two of his films, The Lemon Tree and The Syrian Bride. All right. And in The Syrian Bride, one way that Iran Rickless uh, incorporates transnational themes is by covering the concept of borders and citizenship. And so The Syrian Bride follows Mona, who is a young Druze woman living in the Golan Heights, and her upcoming wedding is disturbed by Israeli-Syrian tensions. Um, and the storyline in this film really uh, encompasses the reality of the transnational identities that's created through these border conflicts. And I'm going to play you a quick clip that sort of she won't. Uh, sort of discusses the focal point of this film and how borders are such um, an important feature in the daily lives of citizens living in this region. She becomes a Syrian citizen, so the Israeli won't let her in anymore and the Syrian won't let her out. As soon as she crosses the border, there's no way back. She comes out. So in this clip, two UN peacekeepers are sort of discussing the future of Mona's citizenship once she marries her Syrian fiance and is no longer considered a citizen of Israel in the Golan Heights region. Um, and so she's sort of facing this decision of leaving her home forever. Um, and I thought this was a really interesting um, feature to cover on Iran Rickless' parts because he's sort of incorporating these new themes of bureaucracy and citizenship. Um, these are central motifs throughout the film, and he demonstrates this disconnect that these transnational citizens um, experience when they're trying to, you know, go through celebrations in their life or when they're trying to, you know, grow up and they realize that they have to make these really big decisions regarding the future and their identities, um, especially when they leave their home territory and, and they have to take on these, these big decisions with them. And so I think that's one way in the Syrian pride that he focuses on these transnationalist identities and the growing realities that modern citizens face. And moving on, I want to sort of cover the diaspora and transnationalism in The Lemon Tree, which is his next feature film that was released in 2008. And this film explores a relationship between two women from different sides of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, and this isn't the main focal point of the film. You would think that the conflict is something that he really wants to um, drive home towards, but instead I really wanted to understand his depiction of transnationalist identities as well, because um, one aspect of the film is when both of the protagonist's children, uh, one from Israel and one from Palestine, both of their children live in the same region in the United States, which is Washington, D.C. Um, and in many conversations, Iran Rickless highlights the 
relationship that these mothers have with their children who are living outside of Israel and the questioning that they receive from their children on why are they not in the United States with them and why are they not leaving their home countries um, to sort of in, encourage this more Western identity. Um, and he he sort of highlights this commonality of um, citizens experiencing these transnational families and how they're exceeding Israel's national borders. And he highlights this isolation and how these um, women in such an interconnected world would have such an uh, isolated feeling. And I think he's really reimagining what the Israeli citizenship and experience really constitutes by subverting um, this depiction of uh, migration to the United States and vice versa. And he sort of highlights this reality that it's not always, the grass is always green on the other side, as you see with the children, um, the the Palestinian um, mother, her son is working as a dishwasher in the United States, but he keeps imploring his mother to come live with him and whatnot. And so you sort of see that disconnect in realities that Iran Rickless is portraying. And so one thing that I wanted to highlight before I conclude my presentation is a quote from Iran Rickless himself, who says that he wants to bring the complexity of Israel to the screen. And he is encouraging the shift of transnationalist identities in cinema because he believes himself that these films are not made on behalf of the government and that they should be allowed to explore controversial and sensitive issues. Um, and how he thinks that this is the best way to encourage Israeli cinema to the rest of the world. And now just to conclude my future implications and conclusions, um, today more Israeli filmmakers are inspired by their transnational upbringings in such a globalized, interconnected world. And so they're looking to depict the reality of challenges faced by populations of all backgrounds living within and beyond Israel's borders. And uh, now this movement of transnational identity and production styles, um, unfortunately, it can have good and bad um, impacts on the industry as some believe that it's drawing audiences away from national focuses and celebration of um, Israel's culture. Um, and it may conflict with the Zionist ide ideologies of having a Jewish state. Um, and in, in response to this, the government is actually desiring a return to a more distinctly Israeli cinema that we saw with the 1954 laws that encouraged a, a national cinema. Um, and one future implication that this could provide is that Benjamin Netanyahu's party is encouraging more legislation that limits funding for Israeli cinema and supervises what film productions are producing. Um, and I think this is just an interesting dynamic to see with the evolution of the Israeli cinema and how transnationalist these themes are sort of um, encouraging a new dynamic and a new um, environment within cinema and filmmakers from Israel. And that concludes my presentation. Great, thank you so much, Laura, that was great. Um, our next presentation on this panel is Sanaya. So whenever you're ready. So hi, my name is Sanaya. Um, I go to UCLA and my paper was on comparisons of Zionism and Indian nationalism in the conflicts over Israel, Palestine and Kashmir. So to start off, I, I wanted to go through a few definitions that I used for my paper. Um, the first one being nationalism, which I define as a 19th century movement, so more modern and based on ideas of collective identity, self-determination and autonomy. Um, I define Zionism as a form of Jewish nationalism, specifically focusing on the idea of a Jewish national home in Israel-Palestine and Indian nationalism as a movement that emerged as a response to British colonization um, as people in the region uh, felt, a, felt a collective identity and cohesion. And then finally, I examine settler colonialism in parts of my paper, and I define this as the replacement of the local population of colonized territory with a new society of settlers. Um, so I, I examined uh, the comparisons between Zionism and Indian nationalism in a few um, different lenses. And so the first one was as both of them as anti-colonial movements. And I split these into two examples of, um, of the first one being education, where these movements would have schools that would kind of go against the norm of Western colonial schools. And so for Zionism, 
And this included um, schools to educate Jewish children in Hebrew, and not only that, but also um, science, because this was an Enlightenment reform movement. And this was an alternative to schools such as missionaries. Um, and the second example would be when anti in anti-colonial movements, um, males project fears of emasculation at the hands of the colonial state onto women. Um, and this kind of typecast women as seducers of men and is a form of misogyny. So in Zionism, this was represented, the male was um, called the Balabat, and it was represented as a male that was um, dominated by females. In India, um, the Arya Samaj did a similar thing with education where they um, created schools to educate Indian children in the Vedas, um, which is a form of religious school as an alternative to, again, Western colonial schools. And in, similar to the Balabat, the Babu, which was created in Bengali culture, was um, politically emasculated and feminized. Um, the second lens that I looked at was interest in the land. Um, so I first looked at a British imperialist interest in both Palestine and Kashmir. So for Palestine, it was more of a strategic area for defending Britain's path to India since it was east of the Suez Canal. So as you can see in the image, um, sort of that path where it points out the canal, the Palestine was to the east of that. Um, and then Kashmir was one of the princely states of um, of India, which was at the time Britain's probably most valuable colonial asset. Um, and then Zionism and Indian nationalism, on the other hand, um, saw the land as more than just uh, for their economic or strategic benefit. So for Zionism, there were religious regions, uh, reasons such as the Temple Mount and Western Wall. Um, and they kind of saw historic Palestine as their as the Jewish national home rather than um, a European country that they could have been coming from. And for Indian nationalism, uh, these two images show a shrine and a temple um, in Kashmir, which uh, is for both Hindus and Muslims. And the Kashmiri National Conference Party, which was the dominant party um, at the time, had political ties to India since it focused on a more secular government, um, unlike Pakistan, which was formed on ideas of religious nationalism. The third um, lens I look at is British partition or presence in the area. Um, so for Israel Palestine, there was the Balfour Declaration in 1917 and the White Paper in 1939. And as you can see um, in the text of these words, there is a lot of vagueness. Um, they don't really describe what a national home would mean. And then they also don't really define any borders or, or anything else really that would specify what the two states really are. Um, and in the Indian region, they released the Indian Independence Act, which created two independent dominions, India and Pakistan. But each princely state, a lot of them had their own nationalist aspirations, and the main one being Kashmir. Um, so the Kashmiri prince, when this partition happened, signed a standstill agreement between um, Pakistan and India because he didn't want to be part of either either nation. Um, they wanted to form their own state, but eventually Pakistan invaded the region and he has assigned accession to India in order for protection. Um, so as you can see, both of these policies were very vague um, and eventually created conflict on the ground as um, because people were unclear of which land belonged to which nation and how the nations were going to be divided. So a theory is that this was actually a means um, by the British for post-imperial control by creating weak and, heavy con and con conflict-heavy states that will continue to rely on Britain for economic support long after imperialism has ended. So in basically they're creating client states. And the question um, that this leads us to is to ask whether these policies were vague on purpose. Um, so moving on to the next uh, region, or sorry, lens, I looked at militarization. Um, and so for Zionism and Indian nationalism, both had narratives of security and being anti-terrorist. Um, so in the form of Zionism, it came through the Second Intifada, for example, where Hamas launched a series of suicide bombings. Um, and they became like sort of an image of, they tried to create an image of freedom fighters against Israel, um, which caused uh, Israel to heavily, heavily militarize the West Bank. 
So there's approximately 100 military checkpoints in the West Bank, um, and the citizens there or the Palestinians there are subject to military law instead of civil law, which can be much harsher, um, more discriminatory. And this, these checkpoints also prevent movement and in turn economic growth for the Palestinians. The similar thing um, with India where the Minister of Home Affairs daughter was kidnapped by the Jammu and Kashmir Liberation Front, um, which sparked a series of attacks against Indian officials and forced Kashmiri pundits, which are basically just Hindus in the Kashmiri Valley, to flee the valley, and many of them um, remain displaced to this day. And Kashmiri pundits are um, mostly considered Indian citizens um, right now uh, because they're Hindu and Kashmir is majority Muslim. So India um, militarized Kashmir and that has remained to this day one of the most um, heavy, heavily militarized regions in the world. But this also has impacts on the Kashmiris on the ground with a litany of human rights um, abuses such as sexual violence against women um, through the, the military that's there and forced disappearances of many people in the, in the region. So the, the next um, topic I want to look at is displacement. And this is kind of where Zionism and Indian nationalism differ. So for Zionism, um, the there was the al nakba which um, translates to the catastrophe, where Zionists forced Palestinians out of their homes um, in what they established as Israel. And now many are still refugees and have a feeling of homelessness as they're away from the land that they were on previously and many people say um, they could just become a part of a different Arab state, but they feel that that land was their home originally and many want to go back. Um, whereas for India, they passed Article 370 and Article 35A. Um, the first one being to gave, gave Kashmir the power to block federal legislation um, without passing it through state legislation first. And then Article 35A allows the Kashmiri government to define residency within their borders. So this kind of political structure offers a degree of autonomy and um, prevents this displacement because the Kashmiri government on their own can define residency within their borders. However, um, for the future outlook in um, August, on August 15th, or August 5th, 2019, um, the BJP party, which is the nationalist party um, considered generally conservative in India, repealed both of these articles and passed the Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Act, which um, created two union territories under the control of the Indian government, um, which uh, falls under Indian nationalist aspirations of creating one um, state with Kashmir in it. And removes the barriers of displacement of the Kashmiri people. So the impact still remains to be seen as this was um, more of a recent act and a lot of people have protested it since. Um, and so to go to some conclusions, I found a lot of similarities um, between Zionism and Indian nationalism with intentions founded on anti-colonial ideas, interests in the land for religious and cultural re reasons and militarization, um, uh, for anti-terrorist narratives. However, Zionism can be classified as more of settler colonialism due to the displacement of uh, Palestinians, unlike Indian nationalism, which created a framework for preventing displacement. But Indian nationalist parties have broken down those barriers more recently, so the impacts still remain to be seen. Um, and finally, uh, British policies affected both nationalistic goals as they were vague and exacerbated the conflicts on the ground. So this also provides a lens or a different way of looking at British colonization and understanding the intents um, that could have possibly created uh, client states and, and had impacts um, to this day. So, yeah. All right, thank you so much, Sanaya. Um, our next presenter is Samantha Brody. So whenever you're ready, Samantha. So my name is Samantha, and today I want to explore some of the ways in which Palestinian and Israeli nationalist narratives impact the way that we understand the 1967 war and how those narratives can be used to bring people together. Um, 
So the 1967 war goes by several different names depending on the perceived outcome of the war. Um, the 1967 war is the term that I try to hold myself to use because it's perceived as the most neutral. Um, in the Israeli narrative, um, it's known as the Six Day War for its miraculous speed. Um, and in the Palestinian narrative, it's often referred to as the Naksa, meaning the setback for its kind of disastrous um, implications for the Palestinian nation um, in, during and after the war. Um, whatever you call it, ev almost everyone can agree that this is a really, um, this is a watershed moment in the changing landscape of the Middle East and especially in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So I thought it was worth exploring. Um, so something that I wanna make sure that I introduce and spend some time on is the idea of different historical narratives. Um, the first narrative style that I wanna focus on is the dual national narrative, um, which is often what we see in news and um, in movies. Uh, it perpetuates a violent kind of image of a conflict, um, particularly the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, this is often seen, and it perpetuates disagreements and the idea that resolution is pretty much impossible. Um, and this is often contrasted with a newer perspective on history, relational history, which promotes optimism and the idea that by looking at the relationships between people, um, you can actually use history to bring people together. Um, most of the time, relational history is used to focus on civilians and um, whether it's economics, trade, um, interpersonal relationships. Um, but I'd actually like to propose looking at nationalist narratives through this relational history optimism and demonstrate that nationalist narratives don't need to be used to perpetuate this violent, ir irreconcilable, ir irreconcilable um, framework. So the first narrative that I want to look at is the Israeli nationalist narrative, which sees both Egypt's role as a threat and Palestinian um, violence as feeding into this Israeli victimhood narrative that ultimately paints the picture of the 1967 war as a war of defense. Um, so the first thing that I want to focus on is these middle three sections, the light blue, the light green, and the light orange, um, which are labeled in a lot of uh, Israeli historical narratives as Egypt's kind of three acts of aggression. Um, and these actions lead to Israelis feeling threatened physically, um, and ultimately the idea that it's either strike for strike first or be struck and be eradicated. Um, and so if you just look at these three parts of the um, timeline, then it looks like Egypt is the only threat and ultimately the cause of the 1967 war. But it's also important to go back to 1965 and um, Fatah, which is a Palestinian militant group, um, attacking an Israeli, uh, sorry, an Israeli water pumping station, which in the Israeli narrative is also seen as a violent threat and kind of similarly um, leads to Israel feeling um, as though if they don't attack first, then they will be attacked later. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also important to note that the Israeli nationalist narrative groups um, basically every Arab threat into one category, which is important later because they don't see themselves that way. But this kind of creates a picture of there's a lot of violence around us, so we got to strike first, otherwise we're going to end up getting attacked. Um, which is kind of this is Yitzhak Rabin's understanding. Um, Yitzhak Rabin ended up becoming the prime minister of Israel later. At this point, I think he was in the IDF. Um, he saw a physical threat. He says, you know, we have to beat them to the punch. Otherwise, I don't know what's going to happen to us. Um, and kind of frames the entire lead up to the war as like fear of destruction and a preemptive strike as the only way to protect their people. Um, alternatively, the Palestinian nationalist identity um, and the narrative of the lead up to the 1967 war is... Um, Sorry, I lost my train of thought there. I'm just going to start that sentence over. Um, the Palestinian nationalist narrative of the lead up to the 1967 war is less about a fight for physical security, but rather ideological security. Um, 
exploring both the ways that Israel um, seems to threaten Palestinian nationalism and also the ways that other Arab countries threaten um, Palestine, uh, Palestinians ever achieving independent nationhood. Um, so first, I want to touch on the perception of Israel by Palestinians at this time. Um, leading up to the war, it's broadly accepted by Palestinian nationalists that Israel's preemptive strike is on the way to kind of a land grab. Um, it, there's an understanding that Israel wanted to just gain territory, and they actually exaggerated the defensive position that they portrayed in media and in their own um, conversations, that that was completely exaggerated in order to justify um, gaining territory and attacking um, Palestinians and the Arab world at large. Um, Interestingly, it also goes back, the catalyst itself in the Palestinian nationalist narratives goes back to 1953 with the Johnson Plan, which was a plan proposed by the United States that allocated the water from the Jordan River prim primarily to Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon, although some of it did go to Israel. And because of this, um, those three Arab countries decided actually not to ratify it. And as a result, Israel diverted a lot of the water, almost all of the water, and really left nothing to those three Arab nations, which was seen by Palestinians and also by the broader Arab world um, as kind of a violent attack, a threat to their ability to live, um, and is seen as kind of the start of the lead up to the war um, and frames the war as an act of Israeli aggression. Um, starting to wrap up a little bit, but I just want to also touch on the relationship between um, Arab countries in the area and Palestinian nationalists. Um, there was kind of a blurred boundary between the two interests because of the increased want for Palestinian independence around this time. Um, certain Palestinian groups started to attack Israel and kind of one-off guerrilla attacks on Israel. And because Israelis tended to see Palestinians as part of a larger um, Arab antagonist group. They attacked other Arab countries who were obviously not so thrilled to be receiving the brunt of the retaliation for actions that they weren't necessarily involved in. And so then Arab nations start to try to quell Palestinian nationalism in order to protect their own countries, um, which for Palestinian nationalists, um, means that, you know, the ten the tensions are very, very high at this point and kind of paints Arab countries as secondary antagonists, certainly not primary, but secondary antagonists during the lead up to and during the 1967 war. Um, and so I think this has really interesting implications for the understanding of the 1967 war as a whole. Um, and I think it's really important, especially the idea of extinction kind of goes through both Israeli and Palestinian nationalist narratives, um, whether it's physical safety as in the Israeli narrative or ideological and national um, identity um, in the Palestinian narrative. And I also thought it was interesting to point out kind of Egypt particularly and their role as an antagonist in both narratives. And so I just want to um, point those two things out and show that nationalism and nationalist history can theoretically be something that we can use to draw conclusions of, um, can, we, can be used to draw parallels rather than dividing communities entirely. Great, awesome work, Samantha. And now we're on to our last presentation for this panel. Uh, so Noah Kipnis, whenever you're ready. Uh, well, thank you again for having me today and for the opportunity to present my research. Uh, so again, my name is Noah Kipnis and I'm a recent graduate from the University of Virginia's program in political and social thought. In March of 2022, I traveled to Belfast, the capital of Northern Ireland, where I came across murals with international and global anti-colonial struggles depicted on them, such as the mural you see on the slide right now. Often the movement for Palestinian self-determination was depicted in these murals signifying that in the present day, people in Ireland look to the Middle East with a political and social interest and even in solidarity. In fact, since the beginning of the 20th century, people in Ireland have looked to the Middle East and vice versa. 
The research I'm presenting today is the first chapter of my senior thesis, which examines the evolution of the links between people living in Ireland and mandatory Palestine during the 20th century. The majority of the research on the topic I chose focuses exclusively on the Irish perspectives towards Israel-Palestine. My research expands on the work done before me by taking a comparative historical approach. Through this method, I'm able to trace not only Irish expressions of solidarity towards Israel-Palestine, but also understand how these nations looked back, an equally vital component of solidarity. Today, I will be discussing the historical factors that led Catholic nationalists in Ireland and Jewish Zionists to advocate for independence and the role the British played in both these movements. Then I will dive into the ways Zionist and Irish nationalist leaders express solidarity with one another. And finally, I will address how the relationship between Irish nationalists and Jewish Zionists changed in 1947 and 1948 when Irish nationalists began to be more critical of Zionism and uh, even feel more connected to the Palestinian movement for liberation and statehood. So for the first half of the 20th century, nationalists in Ireland understood themselves as connected to Jewish Zionists living in Palestine under the British, and Jewish Zionists expressed solidarity with Irish nationalists as well. Both groups wanted to establish independent, sovereign nations, yet faced oppression at the hands of the British Empire. In Ireland, British intervention was felt since the beginning of the 12th century, when the British first colonized the area. The British used colonial tactics like divide and rule to pit the native Irish Catholic population and the English Protestants set to Ireland to settle there against one another and to further subjugate the native Catholic population of Ireland. At the end of the 19th century, campaigns for autonomy from Britain within Ireland, known as the Home Rule Movement, began to emerge. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't cover this in detail. However, it is important to understand that the Home Rule movement increased tensions within Ireland as it was opposed by groups within Ireland who were loyal to Britain. Then during World War I, the campaign for greater autonomy from Britain transitioned into a call for outright independence, which led to the 1916 Easter Rising. At this time, Irish nationalists established a provisional independent government in Dublin, uh, but were quickly forced to surrender to the British. At the same time, Jewish Zionists made their own calls for the establishment of a state. Some of the first pioneers to Palestine, like the Bilu group, felt they deserved to establish a home in Palestine as, quote, the archives of history show it is theirs. However, they and other Zionist organizations understood that establishing the state would be nearly impossible without the cooperation of the government in control of then Palestine, which after the 1916 Sykes-Picot Agreement was Great Britain when they established a mandate government there. So clearly the British are inextricably linked to an accurate understanding of the relationship between nationalists in Ireland uh, and mandatory Palestine. Uh, this is because the British saw the political situations in Ireland and mandatory Palestine as one and the same. In Britain, those who wanted to suppress Irish campaigns for home rule and independence also believed in strengthening the British Empire through establishing a state in Palestine that would be Jewish and loyal to the British. My paper gives a few examples of this, but the one I think is most telling is found in a historical figure named Lord Arthur Balfour who many of us here know as the father of the 1917 Balfour Declaration, which declared support for the creation of a Jewish national home in Palestine. Before Balfour wrote this declaration, however, he was one of the British officials leading the charge against the home rule movement in Ireland. Through his position, he actually received the nickname Bloody Balfour after commanding police forces to open fire during an Irish land reform protest in 1887, leading to the death of three people. So in the same way that the British repressed Irish nationalism, Jewish Zionists also began to feel stifled by the British, especially after the 1939 White Paper, which drastically reduced Jew Jewish immigration to mandatory Palestine. Reacting to British colonial repression is also where Catholic nationalists in Ireland and Jewish Zionists in Palestine felt a shared sense of solidarity. During the early 20th century, Irish nationalists influenced Zionist fighting techniques, 
uh, Jewish Zionists translated Irish nationalist books into Hebrew. And in fact, former Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir used the name Michael as his wartime code name uh, after the prominent Irish nationalist leader Michael Collins. Furthermore, Zionist leader Vladimir Jabotinsky even traveled to Ireland in 1938 to meet with Irish nationalist leaders. He also explicitly compared the two movements and expressed sympathy with the Irish in a Russian newspaper. It is clear that Zionist leadership in Palestine looked to Ireland, uh, but Irish nationalists looked back in solidarity too. I detail a few examples of this in my paper, but one telling example uh, of this support comes from Michael David, an Irish activist who wrote a book about anti-Semitic violence during the 1903 Kishinev pogrom. He explicitly states that the book's goal is, quote, to put forward a plea for the objects of the Zionist movement. Furthermore, he compares the oppression of Jews in the diaspora and Catholics in Ireland to show his Irish audience that both causes are legitimate and worth fighting for and even have some similarities. While there was solidarity between Irish nationalists and Jewish Zionists in the early 20th century because of their shared experiences of oppression under the British Empire, that solidarity shifted following the establishment of the Israeli state in 1948. Irish attitudes towards Israel-Palestine shifted as the Irish began to see their struggle under colonialism as more closely related to Palestinians living under Israeli rule. Furthermore, the late 1940s featured the proposed partition of Palestine into two states, a policy the Irish were vehemently against, seeing it as a vestige of British colonial rule. Opposition to the partition plan from Catholics in Ireland meant that they were also slow to recognize the Israeli state once it was established. The Irish did not grant Israel de facto recognition until 1949 and waited until 1963 to give Israel legal recognition. It is paramount to talk about this moment of cultural and political solidarity between these global nationalist movements and also to track their shift over time. Studying nationalist movements in an international framework allows us to not only better understand the movements themselves, but also the international context in which they belonged. So I thank you all again for the opportunity to speak and share this research, uh, and I look forward to answering any questions. Great, Noah, thank you so much for that, that was great. Um, so that marks the end of the presentations for this panel. And I hope you're all going to join me now in applauding our panelists virtually or physically in the frame for their excellent work. Um, so as the chair of the panel, I want to use a few minutes to offer some of my remarks on the panel theme in general and on the papers in particular. And then we should have some time at the end of this panel for questions from the audience or for the presenters to ask questions to one another. So as you'll all have noticed, the title for this panel was Zionism and Other Nationalisms, which means that naturally each of our panelists and their each of our panelists worked on nationalism, um, such a ubiquitous buzzword in the social sciences and humanities now, in one way or another. So what I want to do is briefly explain what nationalism is, uh, for those of you who may not know, what nationalism has meant for the production of scholarship in the last two centuries, and how the work of each of our panelists fits into this larger panorama. So in the most basic sense, uh, nationalism is a political movement that revolves around a group of people who have been organized into a nation. So nationalism is a fundamentally modern concept dating back to a few civic universalist movements in the 18th century. So the American Revolution, French Revolution are examples of that, but even more so to the proliferation of ethno-nationalist movements in the mid 19th century. So a hallmark feature of nationalist movements is the presumed kind of essential unique, uniqueness or singularity of the nation, um, except for the fact that all nationalist movements are more or less variations on this same theme. So there's a little bit of a tension where every nationalist movement posits the uniqueness of the nation, but in this way, they are all more or less the same. They're all permutations of the same thing. So the details change, but the foundations are consistent. So in scholarship, Nationalism and, related, and its related ideas have shaped decades of scholarship, um, particularly history, um, from the 18th century through to the mid 20th century. Um, it's largely fallen out of fashion to do nationalist scholarship now, although it does still pop up from time to time today, especially in pop history and depending on where in the world you're looking at. So scholarship written in a nationalist paradigm 
often possesses kind of these following traits. So it's designed to support the myths and the ideology of the nation, whatever nation we're talking about. Um, it treats the nation that it focuses on as special, as unique. It's often parochial and limited to study of just that nation, so it doesn't really look outwards. Um, and it takes the existence of things like nations and borders at face value, and it doesn't question the existence of those things and how they came into being. Um, so as I just mentioned, this kind of nationalist scholarship, at least in academia, has really fallen out of fashion. Um, the so-called cultural turn of the mid-1980s, and I know one of our presenters uh, cited Zachary Lockman, so he's part of this, <laughs> this turn. So after the cultural turn in history in the mid-1980s, scholars began to question the ostensible self-evidence of the nation and nationalism. So the scope of this kind of work, this kind of post-cultural turn work, looks beyond one nation um, to legacies of empire and to contemporary transnational belonging. It questions the myth of the nation and of nationalism. Nationalism becomes not the rubric from which we write scholarship, uh, but really the subject of scrutiny. Um, and so it's this kind of scholarship, this newer wave of scholarship on nationalism to which each of our panelists contributes. So I wanna offer just a little bit on each of the papers to explain how these papers relate to this bigger trend in studies of nationalism. So Laura Lee's work exemplifies this kind of new scholarship on nationalism in the realm of film studies and film history. So she charts how over the last century, Israeli film has really shifted away from the nationalist goal of building a nation state towards exploring transnational diasporic and layered notions of identity. Uh, gone is Israeli cinema's focus on nationalist tropes, so to speak, and in its place, we see much more of a focus on cross-border relationships, cross-identity relationships, and encounters between peoples. As Laura highlights in her paper, film is a larger reflection of culture in general. So studying film in this way gives us an intriguing look into the changing place of nationalism in Israeli society, at least kind of amongst the artistic class, although we also got into kind of the pushback from the nationalist forces in the state today. Uh, Sanaya Joshi and her work challenges kind of the essential uniqueness of the nation, right? So this is one of the things that I was talking about by subjecting two kinds of nationalisms in this case. So Zionism and Indian nationalism to a compare contrast analysis that looks beyond a singular nation to multiple places. Um, she unmasks what are key similarities and kind of key running themes in these two national movements. And some of these as she covered includes sameness and kind of the modernizing discourse of the early ideological leaders, um, the extent to which both of the cases that she studies are shaped by British imperial aims, both in the imperial period itself and in the post-empire, um, and the modern kind of rhetoric of militarization and protectionism. Um, all of these are kind of similar traits that we see from nation to nation, which reinforces, you know, they're not actually all that unique. They are kind of variations on similar ideas. Samantha Brody uh, put two nationalisms that we often think of as very diametrically opposed to one another, so Zionism and Palestinian nationalism in direct conversation with each other on her work on the 1967 war. And by doing this, by scrutinizing nationalism and the idea of nationalism, nationalist narratives itself, she reveals that there are actually more similarities than we might think um, in Israeli and Palestinian narratives of 1967. And perhaps most notable or most grabbing and arresting of those is that in both the Israeli and Palestinian narrative, there is a shared fear of erasure, um, either literally or ideologically, at the hands of pan-Arab forces in the world in this war. And lastly, uh, Noah Kipnis compares and contrasts Zionism and Irish nationalism in the 19th and 20th centuries in order to, again, kind of highlight these key similarities between these national movements. Um, and here again, another interesting feature of this is that we see really the importance of the British Empire and the legacy of empire on national movements um, as a common enemy in this case for both the Zionists and for the Irish nationalists. And these kind of insights that she gains in her work are really only possible when we move beyond this parochial one nation focus. So again, this is an example of what we gain um, from kind of a new cultural turn look at the history of nationalism. And all of this is to draw attention to the fact that the work that each of the panelists did is in conversation with really cutting edge and current trends of professional scholarship. Um, their work was original, compelling, and it adds to really our greater overall knowledge. This is what professionals are doing. And so I just wanna encourage each panelist to continue on their projects and to reaffirm like it is adding something very important to what people are doing today in the realm of history or political science, film studies, whatever you see yourself 
as doing, and I hope that you will continue to work on it because it adds so much value for all of us. And with our remaining time, I'd like to open the floor to questions from the audience, um, either from panelists, panelists or from other chairs to our panelists, kind of whoever has a question. Go ahead and raise your hand. Yeah, Ashvini, I see you. Yeah, so I loved all the papers, um, but Noah, my question is for you. And I know that you mentioned that this was the first chapter of your senior thesis um, and that you traveled to Ireland as well. So I guess I was um, curious about how you ended up choosing Ireland um, and Irish nationalism as like a comparative uh, form of nationalism for your paper and also like what your research methods were. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so I, I talked about it a little bit in my presentation, but I think uh, the reason that I chose to look at these two forms of uh, nationalism uh, in particular is because of the uh, really explicit way that this kind of solidarity was being demonstrated um, in the, the murals that I came across when I was in Belfast. Um, when I first saw them, I kind of felt like, you know, Ireland and, and Israel Palestine are so far away from each other. So the, the link wasn't super apparent to me. Uh, but then upon further research, I uh, understood that the connections have been existing for a long time. Uh, and that, you know, motivated me to uh, look into that more. Um, they're also uh, in last year, July of 2022, uh, President Joe Biden actually gave a speech where he kind of alluded to those links as well. Um, he talked about his perspectives as uh, an Irish Catholic, obviously in America, but someone that still really resonated with, um, you know, Irish culture and everything. And he said that uh, his experiences as an Irish Catholic were like not unlike the history of Palestinians or something like that. Um, and so I thought that because this, this link is so, you know, uh, apparent in so many people's minds, uh, I would be interesting to study, uh, and it definitely was. Um, the other chapters of my thesis uh, focused more on uh, institutions within Ireland uh, and Israel-Palestine that made uh, apparent connections with each other. Um, so I looked a lot into um, newspaper archives and stuff like that just to see uh, what everyday average ordinary people were saying uh, in regards to the conflict in Israel-Palestine and also just uh, the troubles going on in Ireland, um, which happened in the like late 60s. Um, and then I did also dedicate a chapter to the various murals in Ireland um, as a, a way to um, sort of promote solidarity uh, among internationalist movements. Uh, so that's another thing that I was studying. Um, yeah, so thank you for your question. Hope I answered that. Great, are there other questions from the audience or I can formulate some of my own while people are still formulating in the audience. But uh, as you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand in the chat so that I know to call on you. But I'm gonna jump in and use my chair privileges to ask my own question first. Um, so I'm actually gonna ask this question to Sanaya and to Noah. Both of you are looking at contexts like multiple, na multiple nations, but also in all of your contexts, like the legacy of the British empire is so looming kind of in like why these national movements look the way they do. So it's just kind of an open-ended question. There's no real right or wrong, but like, what do you think overall, like the importance of the British empire has been to the histories that you studied? Like, do you see it as like a critical role, like a critical factor or something that is a little bit more secondary? Um, I can go first. I think um, for me, I, I would say in in the case of India and Kashmir, I think it played more of a critical role um, because the British colonized India for so long and um, he created the like act that directly split India and Pakistan. Um, whereas I think in um, like Israel Palestine, there were already kind of conflicts between um, the Zionists and Palestinians in the region. Um, where, and in India and Kashmir, there weren't really that many um, conflicts between two creating nations. Like the states kind of already had their own nations and didn't really think about 
creating uh, broader nations. So I think it depends on the region, but um, I would say for both, it definitely did have impacts like to this day. Yeah, um, and just to add to that, I definitely agree. I think that, um, as I mentioned in my speech, you know, the British were a very big kind of dominating force in Ireland for so long. Um, and I think that the hundreds of years of that kind of systematic subjugation and oppression um, of Irish Catholics uh, in Ireland leaves a very lasting impact that maybe wasn't achieved so much in Israel-Palestine just because that period of uh, colonial rule was a lot shorter. Um, but I do think that the, the legacy of British colonial rule is very much still felt and understood in Ireland. Um, even when I was talking about, you know, the, the opposition to the partition plan, uh, you know, they cite uh, this kind of legacies of colonialism as the reason for why they're so opposed to it. And so I think that um, that kind of memory uh, that goes beyond, you know, through each generation uh, is very much uh, being uh, affected by this, this lasting period um, of British colonialism that happened in Ireland. But I agree with Sanaya that I think uh, it's a little bit different and a little bit more nuanced in Israel-Palestine, uh, which is why it was so interesting to study because I was wondering if maybe there were other forces at play that kind of created this solidarity. Um, so, no, that's a great point. I actually want to ask a quick follow-up question for you, Noah, because I work on a similar time period. I work like more specifically in the mandate itself, but I've also looked kind of into their links with the Irish, like the Leshy, the Urgun, kind of the more radical groups and their links to the Irish. You do also mention like there's a lot of memory, there's a lot of ideology, but there is in a sense like literal sameness in the British officials who move from Ireland to Palestine and then often to like places like Malaysia or to India. They do kind of their big colonial tour before they head back to the metropole. So you highlighted for us Lord Balfour, but I was wondering who else you came across as kind of someone who cut their teeth in like several different colonial contexts, British officers who you see in multiple places in the world. Who did you kind of come across in your research? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so actually, uh, there were definitely, as you were saying, this kind of like tour of colonialism um, that was going on. Um, and so in Ireland uh, in the 1920s, um, when the British were kind of deployed to um, you know, have peacekeeping efforts, um, they deployed the Royal, sorry, Royal Irish Constabulary. Um, and this force was trained in Dublin, um, but you know, they were very active, um, especially during the Irish War of Independence at kind of stifling rebellion. Um, and then actually after the Irish War of Independence ended, the Royal Irish Constabulary was dissolved in Ireland but in effect uh, kind of reformed uh, in Palestine when they were sent there to kind of do similar peacekeeping efforts. Um, and so I thought that that was extremely interesting. Um, and then in general, um, there were many political figures uh, who were British, uh, who kind of understood, as Balfour did, uh, the, the potential benefits of having a loyal uh, area in the Middle East to the British. Uh, so Ronald Storrs, the military governor of Jerusalem um, saw the Balfour Declaration as kind of taking these steps that he thought were necessary to like create a loyal Jewish area um, in, an, in an area of um, the Middle East that he thought would be potentially hostile to kind of have this like outpost almost um, that could be loyal to the British. And I think uh, that logic uh, was also applied decades before in Ireland um, when they sent uh, British Protestants to the area. Um, so very explicit uh, links there. And I thought that that was um, also very uh, interesting to look into as well, especially as, you know, someone that studied Jewish history, I saw Lord Balfour in one specific way, but it was interesting to see um, his impacts in other areas. That would be like a great kind of study for like a thesis if you're continuing to be interested in that kind of the migration of these officials to different places. And I will say like it also like it continues on after Palestine. So that's something else that would be interesting to look at, which is after that ceases to be a British imperial holding, they do still have holdings elsewhere. Um, so for instance, Harold McMichael, one of the high commissioners of Palestine towards the end of the mandate actually ended up in Malaysia immediately thereafter because they still wanted him to be administering the empire, but they could obviously no longer do that after the state of Israel was established. Um, okay, we have four minutes remaining. Are there other questions? I'd like to open it back up to students um, for any questions that you guys might have for any of our panelists.
Hi, I have a question for um, Sinaya. Uh, well, it's more of a comment than a question, I guess, but you could address it. Um, I really enjoyed um, reading your paper, um, but there were two things that your argument. Um, oh no, uh, can you guys hear me? I see the, oh, okay. Um, one is I noticed that when you're establishing your argument about settler colonialism, you don't quite engage with the fact that there was also an indigenous Jewish population um, in Israel at the same time. And I was wondering um, how you kind of correspond because I thought that that, um, so that kind of engaging with that will help you either, you know, establish or refute the idea of, of settler colonialism. Um, and then also, um, you know, and also kind of, I was looking into more sophistication about Hindu in the way in which, you know, there are these arguments that this, that it was a kind of a colonial construction um, and, and kind of how you engage with both of these notions in kind of evaluating these two cases yeah sure so i think um in the first point with like indigenous jewish um people in the area i think there's a lot of nuance with settler colonialism so it's hard to capture it all um, and in my paper, I was trying to look at how intentions can be very different than actions. Um, but yeah, I, I agree that there's a lot more nuance to it that um, I would need to sort of look at because um, I was looking at it more on a broader level. Um, and in terms of the the Hindu um, uh, like temples and things like that, uh, all of a lot of the Kashmiri pundits in the region had been there um, and practicing with these regions, even though the temples might not have been constructed. Um, through my research, I found that a lot of them had been um, practicing uh, their religion in these areas um, for a, a long time before. Um, so I think there are arguments to be made about the actual construction of these temples being like a form of colonialism is they're trying to get um, perhaps like Indian people to travel to the region and actually uh, visit these temples. Um, but um, my thoughts were perhaps there was a connection, a religious connection long before um, even these temples were actually constructed, but the actual region themselves are thought of as the birthplace of some of these gods. So, yeah. Great. Um, I think we're pretty much um, Just a minute. Um, I oh, sorry, really wanted to make one <laughs> quick comment. I think that if you were, that's great. And I think that if you wanted to extend the paper, um, I think that a good way to start and to really kind of make it more robust would be using a more, um, a, a kind of more robust definition of settler colonialism that will enable you to build off of that. Because the one that you're using is very thin as a, and as, as such is not it, it, it doesn't fully enable you to establish your case. So if you kind of take a richer um, definition that is more kind of concise, um, and then I think adding your case would be very, very relevant and super interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Okay, great. I think we are at time now. So that is gonna mark the end of our first panel. I uh, hope you all join me again in applauding our panelists for their excellent work and for starting us off strong. And the next panel, Israel and the Palestinians, will begin in roughly five minutes at 10.20 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Okay, thank you guys so much.